to conferences in Washington come Soviet Ambassador Andrei Gromyko and a Russian delegation, with United States Under Secretary of State Statinius and representatives of Great Britain. The three allied nations are meeting here at Dumbarton Oaks to study world security and formulate a tentative United Nations proposal. Sir Alexander Cadogan of England, Mr. Tustinius, and Secretary Cordell Hull arrive, followed by Ambassador Grumico. The American delegation, the British, the Russian, Secretary Hull speaks. The nations of the world should maintain, according to their capacities, sufficient forces available for joint action when necessary to prevent breaches of the peace. Sir Alexander Cadogan demands punishment for aggressors. The victory of the United Nations, whenever it comes, must be complete. The military defeat of the aggressors must be made clear beyond all doubt and most of all to the German people themselves and those responsible for the wanton outrages that have horrified the civilized world must receive their just retribution. A city of tents for 30,000 citizens of Iceland they have gathered at an historic site outside the capital of Reykjavik, where the world's oldest parliament first met, for a two-day ceremony marking the proclamation of Iceland as a republic. The president and bishop of Iceland as the new republic is born. The American commander on Iceland, General Key, watches the ceremonies. The new government takes office, the cabinet of Sven Björnsson, now president of Iceland. Four years after the beginning of construction, California's mighty Shasta Dam is ready to generate its first power. Shasta is the second largest dam in America. Besides preventing floods and droughts, it will furnish additional electricity for war industries. Tests have proven the great power system ready for transmission. So now water is started through conduits into the 100,000 horsepower turbines that drive the huge generators. Through the transformers and out over the transmission lines surges power from this great new source. Power for the needs of war and of peace. The Pacific Islands Campaign. Off Saipan and the Marianas, a Japanese bomber goes down in flames as a United States task force battles a sudden air attack. An American fighter comes home on one wheel. Two enemy planes at once, one of them on fire. The battle rages on into the night. Guns of another task force in the early dawn batter Biak Island off the north coast of New Guinea.
Following the intense sea and air bombardment, General MacArthur's ground forces move in to land on Biak. Only 10 days before, other MacArthur units invaded Wake Island, 200 miles east. Here on Biak, the objectives are three Japanese airstrips, which in Allied hands will guarantee military control of the whole New Guinea group. Against heavy resistance, American infantry and amphibious tanks push the enemy back and move inland. Specially trained battle dogs help guard against surprise by snipers, as the capture of Biak Island marks the practical end of the New Guinea campaign. Again, within the week, amphibious assault. This time at Numfor Island, 100 miles nearer the Philippines. Infantry land on narrow, hazardous coral reefs, believed by the enemy to be impassable. The Japanese are taken by surprise, and an important air base comes into American possession. Supplies and reinforcements are landed by air at Kamiri Airstrip on Numfor. American lines in the Southwest Pacific have now advanced more than a thousand miles west, 700 miles north from their starting point. This is Guam, the town of Agon, after the crushing bombardment that accompanied the reclaiming of this first American soil taken by Japan. Mass is celebrated in the field as cleaning up operations continue. are carried behind the firing line by their comrades. Near the same United States Marine marker which stood during the Japanese attack two and a half years ago, the stars and stripes are raised once more over Guam. To the north, in the Marianas, towards Tokyo, Saipan Island is now completely occupied. These are native women and children, liberated by the United States forces. On the islands of Saipan and Guam, these peoples lived through the enemy occupation and the battles that ended it. Now they are free. Here on Guam, an American military hospital provides medical care. Navy doctors and native nurses treat the sick. Food is distributed. In the bitter military struggle to win Pacific control from the enemy, the needs and problems of human beings are not overlooked. 